All right, so uh, welcome to Flutes today. Uh, I am at a meeting, a, a conference, giving a talk today, so I'm uh, not able to uh, give the presentation of the lecture today. So hopefully you're seeing this uh, with the TAs in class. Feel free to either uh, pause the lecture and ask questions or to uh, wait until the end of class and ask the TAs questions. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, the next unit. Um, we're gonna, this is lecture 20, integral balances, the, the mass balance. And uh, just as a reminder, your proposals for your fluids project are due next time. And the reading uh, is in uh, Dean chapter 11, 11.1 to 11.2 uh, for this material. And I'd just like to make a quick note as well that this is the first time that I'm using uh, this uh, writing pad that I have connected to the computer. So if I screw up, uh, I apologize, or if the handwriting's a little messy, I'm still trying to figure it out a little bit. I've had some practice, but not a ton, so I appreciate your patience with me. Okay, so I'd like to just sort of start off and talk about uh, where we are in the class. This is sort of a, a, a vista point where we can step back and think about where we are. So let me uh, start here with, um, let me scroll down a little bit and start writing here. We're going to start with one, um, which is uh, macroscopic analysis. Macroscopic analysis. analysis. Okay, and we're going to talk about this in the context of what we've done so far. Okay, so uh, the, f the first thing we did in class was dimensional analysis. If you recall, dimensional analysis. Okay, and, and along with dimensional analysis, we did uh, what I call phenomenology. Okay, phenomenology just means uh, we talked about the phenomena, the physical phenomena. So the things that we talked about here were fluid properties. We talked about pipe flow. And we talked about drag. And we talked about a few other things as well, but that was, for the most part, what we did. So I'm going to put a box around this one. Okay. The second thing that we did, which we just finished, you just took a test on, was the differential theory. Of fluid mechanics. box around that one. Okay, and uh, we started off and, and before the exam, before the end of the other one, we did statics. And for this exam, we talked about kinematics and dynamics. Okay, so uh, and in dynamics, we sort of culminated in Navier-Stokes equation, okay, which was our important. So the whole point of this guy was to understand physical phenomena, and the whole point of this one was to dive deep and understand some of the fundamentals in the theory. Okay, but what about, you know, this is an engineering class, so what about engineering? You know, what about design? Uh, how are we going to go about doing that? Um, and, you know, uh, we could just do empirics. So that was sort of what we talked about before, you know, empirical correlations. So can we do better than empirics? Um, uh, is it all hard theory? Uh, or is there a middle way? And of course, um, there, there is a middle way, which we're going to talk about today. Um, but recognize, you know, the, how hard some of these problems are, right? Uh, we have turbulence. Uh, which we didn't get a chance to talk all about, but turbulence is a difficult problem theoretically, still not uh, completely solved. Um, we also have, uh, you know, complex shapes, right? We only did drag on a sphere. What about a drag on an airplane? Uh, that's a complex uh, thing. What about systems? where we have things that are connected and, and multiple pieces, uh, flow systems, other things. How, how are we going to go about uh, uh, dealing with those kinds of things? 
So uh, the answer, of course, which is the subject of our lecture and the subject of the next several lectures is integral balances. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna write integral balances uh, help us uh, solve these problems. Okay, so you might ask how, how is it that these integral balances solve these, help us solve these problems? Uh, it turns out that, uh, that integral balances bury all of the details uh, of, the, of the flow and that's what enables us to get around a lot of those messy details uh, and solve these design problems. So, so how does it help us? Um, it buries, oops, I'm gonna erase that, that was a mistake. And then I accidentally erased that. Systems, berries, messy details. Okay, so uh, that's the sort of overview of where we're at. We're going to do integral balances. It helps us to be able to do engineering and design. Okay, so now I need a new page here. And it drops us down. Okay, so let's start on this page and we're going to start uh, up here, number two. Which is the integral mass balance. Okay, so consider the following chunk of fluid. So I just kind of give it some non-circular shape. And it has some volume as if that could change with time and some surface that could also change with time. So V is the volume, S is the surface, okay? And it has potentially some uh, normal vector you know, this could be all around the edge of it, but there's some normal vector. And this could be, this whole thing could be moving at some velocity u. Okay? So n is a normal vector. And u is a velocity. Okay? Uh, note that u is not the fluid velocity. It's not the velocity. There could be fluid flowing here. Uh, you know, that's going to flow through this particular system and out the other side, and that would have some velocity v, okay? So v would be the fluid velocity. Oops, fluid velocity. Okay? And so uh, we call this uh, volume uh, the control volume, okay? And we call that surface the control surface. Control volume control surface. Okay, and if you remember, we talked about uh, control volume and a control surface before. There's nothing particularly uh, fancy about them. A control volume is just a volume uh, that we define that we're going to look at. And the one distinguishing feature of it is that it's closed in a mathematical sense, in the sense that uh, you know it's a shape that, that touches itself, right? Uh, and that gives us a surface that we can talk about. Okay, um, so note that uh, velocity fluid can flow in and out of this uh, volume. Um, we can also have uh, the shape change with time. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to be a fixed thing. Okay, and so, uh, you know, how are we gonna go about finding a balance? So that's our task is, you know, how do we do a mass balance? Okay, so uh, maybe the easiest way uh, to do a mass balance is we actually already know a differential balance, right? So, oop, let me erase that, that was messy. We already know one, right? It's the continuity equation.
Okay, so the continuity equation, we all remember, d rho dt uh, plus del dot rho v equals zero. And this is a vector, and that's a vector. Okay, that's the continuity equation. So that applies at any point, right? So that should apply at any uh, point in this space, but the integral over that whole space should also then satisfy uh, uh, mass conservation. So we can just take the integral of both sides of this uh, uh, over the total control volume. So I'm going to do that. I'll take the integral over the total uh, volume, which again could be some function of time, which is going to give me d rho dt plus del dot rho v equals zero. Okay. And oh, I forgot to put my uh, dv for here, and I'll put a little brace over there, and that is going to still equal zero because, of course, I do the integral of both sides, but the integral of zero is still zero. Uh, and I just want to make a note for those of you uh, I remember that you asked me to make sure when I do a little derivation that I point out where in the book is. This is in page 295 of your book. Uh, has this derivation. Okay, uh, mine is a little bit more elaborate uh, and the, or elaborated. It's not more elaborate, but it just gives more of the steps. But the basic steps are there. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do uh, in this is this this is still right. This is a mass balance. It's correct. Uh, to make it in a little more useful form, we're going to try and get rid of the derivatives. So we're going to get rid of that derivative and that derivative inside the the integral. Okay, so we want to uh, get rid of these um, from the inside okay of the integral okay and dv okay we want to get rid of those and we're going to have two uh, mathematical properties that you remember hopefully uh, from your calculus class we're going to use to get rid of them uh, one is the gauss divergence theorem uh, which i'm going to abbreviate as gdt Gauss divergence theorem. The other is the Leibniz integral rule. Which I will abbreviate as LIR. Uh, sorry, that's a little messy. Okay, and I'm going to use the Gauss divergence theorem on this one and the Leibniz integral rule on this one, as you'll see in a second. Okay, so let's remember. Oh, Getting a little messy right there. Let me erase that. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Uh, oh, need a new page. Page, new page after. Okay, uh, we'll go right here and we'll remember what the Gauss divergence theorem is. So the Gauss divergence theorem says the following. The Gauss divergence theorem says that if I have an integral over a volume of the divergence of some vector a, dv, that that equals the integral over a surface of the normal vector dotted with a ds. Okay? And that just says that uh, I have the divergence over a volume that's going to equal uh, the flux uh, through the same surface, right? So if you remember, maybe a physical intuition is I've got this, and a divergence is telling me something about how. Uh, much flux is coming out of a point, and I'm saying, okay, if I go around the surface on the outside, uh, that's telling me how much is going around, you know, going out of that surface as I have some normal vector n, okay, where this would be s and this would be v, okay. If you didn't follow that, you can, that was just a really, really quick and dirty uh, uh, way to remember the Gauss divergence theorem. If you don't remember, go back and look in your multivariable calculus textbook or Google Gauss divergence theorem. Okay, so we can take this and notice that up here we have a divergence of a quantity. This is the mass flux. So we can rewrite uh, uh, that term. Oh, come on. Extemporaneous. Um, I can just rewrite now in terms of the mass flux. What's going to go right there? Uh, this is going to be. Oh, come on. The integral over the volume of del 
dot row v dv equals the integral over a surface of n dot row v ds. Okay, so that's that one term, how I'm going to rewrite it. Okay, so now I need to go to the other term. And for the other term, I'm going to use the Leibniz integral rule. Okay, so the Leibniz integral rule has to do with how we uh, move the derivatives inside and outside of an integral when we have the limits of the integral that depend on uh, that derivative. So to be less cryptic, uh, if I want to know the derivative of some volume integral of a dv, where a is just some quantity, uh, I can rewrite that as, and oh, crucially, this volume depends on time. Okay, I can move that derivative inside and have this partial derivative of a dv, uh, so long as I also take into account the fact that uh, there is some surface term, which is a n dot u ds, okay? And this is equation 11.2-17 uh, in your book. And I forgot to write down that this one right here uh, is equation a.4-31. So that one's in the appendix, the other one is in uh, the chapter reading for this time. Okay, so this is the Leibniz integral rule. And it says we can take this, we want to take the derivative of something here, we can pull it inside uh, if we take into account the what's changing on the surface. Okay, and again, this, this was something you uh, hopefully learned about in calculus. Uh, if you didn't, I can answer more questions about it when I get back. Um, notice that if the, uh, the volume uh, doesn't uh, I guess I need to point out, so this u is the same u we talked about earlier. It's, you know, how the, the it's the velocity uh, of the surface, of the control surface, okay? So if this is zero, uh, if, if it's not moving, that means, you know, s of t is just s, then this is going to go to zero, and then this will just be equal, and we can pull the derivative in and out, so long as that velocity is zero. But if that velocity is not zero, if the you know, if our uh, shape is going like this and then sometime later it's going like this and sometime later it's, you know, done something else, right? Then uh, we have to use this whole equation, okay? So now in our case, if you recall, if you look up here, um, we have already has started with the, the thing on the inside. So what we want to be able to do is pull this one out. So we need to solve for that one, okay? So I'll rewrite this where I'm going to put in row in for the a, so I'm going to put in a row in for all the a's, okay, and I'm just going to move this one over to the left hand side. Uh, so I'll write the integral over v of d rho dt dv equals d dt, now that's a total derivative of v of t, and now this is rho dv minus, because I switched this one to the other side, s of t uh, rho n dot u ds. Okay, so that's now what I have to do. So now I just have to put this and what I got from the Gauss divergence theorem together, okay, into the continuity equation I've integrated, and I'll get out the final answer. Okay, so final answer by combining, you know, all three. Okay, the final thing that I get uh, is the total derivative over v of t of rho dv minus s of t, the integral over s of t of rho n dot 
u ds, okay? And then I need the Gauss divergence one, which was n dot rho v ds. So I have plus the integral over the surface of n dot rho v ds equals zero, okay? So that is the, the answer. And what we notice is that um, when density is a constant, I get the following. Derivative of rho dv uh, plus the integral over the surface of, oh, actually, it doesn't even need to be a constant. Pardon me. This can just come out uh, because this is just n dot v. So I can rearrange that. I can just write that as rho n dot v. I don't even need to say anything about constant. Pardon me. So that's rho n dot v minus u. Equals zero. Okay. Or sometimes this is written. If you notice this, this is just the mass of the control volume. Okay. And this is just the re the re relative velocity. Okay. So this is the velocity of the fluid relative to how my uh, uh, control volume is moving. So I can just write this as d m control volume d t equals minus the integral over the surface of rho n dot v relative. And then the ds. And I forgot to put a ds right here, so I'll go ahead and fix that right now if I can find my eraser. Erase this. This should have a ds equals 0. OK. OK? So that is our, oop, let me go up. Let me put a box around that. That is our integral mass balance. That's what we were hoping to get. OK? So um, let me just sort of point out what is going on here. So let me add a new page. It skips down. Okay, so this is our accumulation term. Okay, that's just saying how much mass is changing in the control volume. Okay, and this is our in minus out term. Okay, it's the net flux in. Okay, and notice that the minus sign. Okay, is there because uh, n is out. Okay, so we have n that's pointing out. So we have to have the minus sign so we get the net flux in. Okay, so uh, that is the integral mass balance. Pretty easy. We have the accumulation term, the change in mass in some control volume with time, and this is just the flux of mass. Uh, the rel you know the relative flux of mass through that surface. Okay, and how did we get here? Uh, we took the integral of the continuity equation. We got uh, rid of those two derivatives so that there was no derivatives inside of any integrals, um, and we did that by using the Gauss divergence theorem and by the Leibniz integral rule. Okay, now moving on, let's do a couple of examples. Why is this useful for us? So this will be section three examples. Okay, so example A is a diverging channel. Okay, so I'm going to draw a diverging channel as well as I can on the computer. This is why I picked to have graph paper background. 
So I could hopefully have some chance of doing this. Okay, and I'm going to make my axes uh, x and y like this. Okay, and I'm going to say there's some uh, a in and there's some v in. Okay, and this v in, okay, can be uh, v in can be some function of x and y. So let me just erase this because I kind of ran out of space to say that. Okay, vn can be a function of x and y. And the same thing here, I've now got a out, okay, and v out x and y. Okay, and the question is uh, if I'm given a in, a out, and v in x and y, can I find v out? Okay, so that's the example. So let's write down our uh, balance equation. So uh, we're going to do uh, this in three steps. So the first step will be to draw the control volume. So I'm going to try and draw another channel here. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, and my control volume is going to be, you know, this is something I can pick, but I'm going to pick this one to be inside the channel, or inside the, yeah, the channel, like this. Okay, it has to be close. So this is my control volume in here, and my control surface is the dashed line around the edge. Okay, and so that's the first thing I need to do is pick a control volume. Uh, and I'm going to write down the balance equation. So the balance equation is uh, d dt of the integral of volume rho dv. That equals minus the integral uh, over the surface of rho n dot and then v minus u ds. Okay, so that's the balance that I'm going to do on that control volume. So this, okay, so now the second thing we need to do is uh, appropriately simplify. Okay, so I need to find things that I can do uh, to simplify this problem. Okay, so now in this case, uh, I can make a number of simplifications. The first thing is that uh, this is steady, right? Nothing's changing with time here. Uh, the second thing I can say is that the control volume is fixed. It's not moving with time, okay? Um, the third thing I notice here is that I have uh, discrete uh, inlet and outlet. Okay, and the fourth thing that I can say uh, is that the density is constant. Okay, and I guess you could you could solve this without a constant density, but we've been doing constant density problems pretty much exclusively. So so long as uh, you know, uh, the velocity magnitude, you know, is less than uh, the speed of sound, right? I'm pretty good on this, or unless I have, you know, mixture, but I'm just doing something pure. Okay, so what do these different simplifications mean? Okay, the steady term, of course, means that my time derivative term is going to go to zero. Okay, the fixed uh, control volume. Uh, is going to mean that the u term, this guy up here, that that one's zero, right? Because that's not moving with time. Uh, and the discrete inlet and outlet is going to simplify uh, my integral, right? Okay, and then the fact that density is constant means I can pull it out of, of these derivatives. Okay, so let me write down 
now what my balance is going to be given that I know these things. Uh, uh, I can write down that 0 equals um, where did my thing go? minus rho, the integral over a n, okay, because that's going to be this side over here. Um, and this is going to be n in dotted with v uh, in plus, or, uh, no, that's right. And then I have a minus here. That's what's wrong. Uh, minus, now the integral over a out, n out dot v out, and then dA. I forgot a dA right here. dA. Okay? So, uh, now what I need to do is evaluate n in, v in, and out, and v out. And if I go up and look at this, I can write down what my n is. So, n out is right here, n out, and over here this is the outward and unit normal, which is n in. Okay? So now the v was in that direction and that direction. So n dot v, n out dot v out is going to be positive, and n in dot v in is going to be negative. And this is going to be in the x direction. Remember that I said this was x and this was y. Okay, so that means that if we could put another page here, um, that I can come right here and say that n in dot v in is going to equal minus v x in and n out dot v out equals v x out. Okay? So now I put that all together and notice that I can, uh, there should have been a row right there. Notice I can cancel the rows so those go away and I get the following. I get 0 equals uh, minus minus cancels, so I get an integral over a in uh, vx in dA minus integral over a out vx out dA. Okay? So now I can say that I want uh, that's you know that's an answer, but it's not quite solved for vx out. I want to solve for vx out, so I'm going to say, well, I know I can make an average, so I can vx in average is equal to one over a in times the integral over vx in dA. Okay, that's an average over the inlet. That's the average velocity, uh, the x component of the velocity over the inlet. So if I can write the same thing for vx out, okay, analogous, 1 over a out integral over a out vx out dA. So now I can rewrite this in terms of averages instead of I had before. So let me scroll up so we can see that one. Uh, I can write. 0 equals vx in times a in minus vx out times a out. Okay, now notice that this is just telling me that I have a flow rate in equals the flow rate out. So when I, in the end, solve for the average vx out. Oh, this should have an angle to it. I get that it's equal to a in divided by a out times the average vx in. Okay, that's my end answer for this one. Okay, 
So uh, this you know didn't really tell me anything spectacular, but I want to point out a couple things about this. Note that uh, we could only find the average vx out. Okay, not vx uh, of x and y. We couldn't find, uh, excuse me, v out. Let me just erase that and make it more explicit. v out. Okay, we couldn't find v out. Uh, this is what I mean by we buried details. We ended up being able to say something about the outlet velocity based on what we knew the inlet velocity would be. But unless they're uniform, we don't know exactly what that velocity is. We only know what the average velocity is. And for engineering purposes, that's actually pretty useful, right? This tells us about flow rates. It tells us about average velocities. But it doesn't tell us the sort of details of the flow. So a differential balance gives us the details. We could have solved, you know, if we did the whole differential equation, we could have solved something about the details. But the reality is that probably those details aren't that interesting for most cases, right? And if we wait until it's fully developed down here, and let's say we know it's laminar, we know what its velocity profile looks anyway. So it's only if we care about this sort of messy region in the middle that we would care to know, okay? So this tells us a lot of useful information for engineering, uh, even if we don't necessarily know every you know, detail about the flow, okay? So that's the first sort of simplest example uh, where uh, I guess I, I, I note as I'm scrolling through this, I'm noticing that I said one, draw the control volume, two, appropriately uh, simplify, okay, and then you know three here was solve, okay, solve our problem, okay. So I forgot to write that down. Okay, so now we're going to go on to another example, B, which is example two, uh, which is a tank draining. Okay, and before we get this example, let me just add a new page, and we'll scroll up. Okay, so we're gonna look at a draining tank. So let me draw the tank. So I've got some rectangular tank here, and I'm gonna come over here and erase a little bit and draw an outlet. I'm going to come over here and erase a little bit, and I'm drawing draw an inlet. Okay? And again, now I'm going to say I know some V in, that's an average, and I know what the area is of the inlet. Okay? And then over here, I know uh, V out, some average V out, and I know the A out. Okay? How might I know these? I might be able to measure the flow rate and know what the area is, and I can back calculate what the average velocity is. Okay? And then uh, I know what the height is at the beginning. And my question that I'm going to ask here is, uh, what is the height as a function of time? Okay, given that h at zero is equal to h zero. Okay. So uh, the first thing we're going to do, part one, draw the control volume. Okay, so I'll come over here. Okay, draw the control volume. And that should kind of go all the way to the edge, so pardon my poor uh, uh, drawing. Okay, part two make simplifications. Okay, and I want to point out I, I sort of draw this control volume cavalierly. Um, but, you know, there's no reason. I could have drawn the control volume into here. I could have drawn it over to here. I could have, you know, done anything. This happens to be a pretty obvious choice of control volume, but it's also a pretty smart choice of a control volume uh, for a couple reasons. Note that this control volume is perpendicular to V out and V in. Uh, that makes uh, doing these calculations uh, easier uh, for a reason that we'll see. Um, uh, so. Uh, also, this control volume is going to move as the height of this tank drains. Okay, that's also an important thing. Okay, so uh, simplifications. Uh, we're now at this step. So, what simplifications can we say? Well, we can certainly say, like we did before, that 
uh, the density is a constant. Okay. Um, uh, we can also say that we have a discrete inlet and outlet. Okay. Um, but note that our control volume is not fixed. and not steady. Okay, so let's write down our balance. We have the time derivative of the integral over the control volume of rho dv equals minus, and then I'm just gonna uh, uh, do the sort of discrete inlet and outlet steps we had before to save us a little time. So I'm gonna say over a in rho minus v in for the same reason that we had before, the area of the inlet, the integral over the area of the inlet, minus, and then rho times v out dA, and this is over A out. Okay, uh, notice that what happened was um, the x component uh, of u uh, is zero. Okay, u was is the velocity of the control volume. So x component is zero. So that term goes away uh, in both of these cases. Okay, so uh, now we have uh, a pretty easy uh, problem to solve. All we need to do is be able to get h out of here. So this is um, uh, we can cancel. Uh, we can pull out all of our densities and cancel them out. And if we do that, I'll do that and write that down. D D T. This is the integral of D V equals uh, my. And this is now a plus. The two negatives form a plus, and I get the average V in times A in minus the average of V out times A out. Okay, this is just the volume over here. Okay, which is the same thing as uh, the area of the top times by the height. Okay, where the area of the top, I mean, this was this area up here. Okay, so now I have a top dh dt, because that's a constant as well, equals v in a in minus v out a out. And I can finally write a differential equation, a simple ODE, which is v in a in minus v out a out divided by the top area. Oop, that was messy. Okay, and I have an initial condition which was h at zero equals h zero. Okay, so this is my ODE, and it's very easy. There's no h's or t's, so this is just you know a constant. So I can in the end write that h of t is equal to h0 um, plus that quantity, v in a in minus v out a out divided by area on the top multiplied by time. Okay, so this just says I have some initial height and this is a uh, uh, volumetric flow rate in minus the volumetric flow rate out divided by the height and that's uh, what the, uh, the height is. So that is our answer. Okay, so this is integral mass balances. This is the end of the lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask the TAs. I will be back on Friday. Uh, and on Friday we will talk about uh, momentum balances uh, and the Reynolds transport theorem. Have a good one.